Supreme Court said that uh, there is a systemic problem with the CBI. The CBI is controlled by the government and it needs to be freed from government's control. And therefore, the Supreme Court passed two kinds of order. They said, firstly, the CBI director should be given a minimum statutory tenure, and you cannot remove him before that. You cannot transfer him out unless he is charged with corruption <coughs> or with some serious act of misconduct. And even in that case, it will not be the government, but some other independent body which will deal with that. And the second thing that they said was, that the CBI should be placed under the supervisory control of the Central Vigilance Commission, which will be given <coughs> statutory status so as to make it independent of the government. And that, they felt, could to at least some measure ensure the independence of the CBI. Unfortunately, despite those orders, Despite the CVC being given statutory status and being made independent of the government and being given supervisory control over the CBI, despite the CBI director being given a statutory status, we still found that the CBI continues to behave under the influence of the government. And the reason was that the CBI's administrative control, that means the power of transfers, promotions, uh, the suspension, etc., still remained with the government. And using that power of transfers, promotions, suspensions, the government was still able to control the actions of the CBI to a very large extent. And that is why, unfortunately, despite that, the political parties who were in parliament, they eventually came out with a very weak Lokpal Act. They did not give control of the CBI to the Lokpal. Uh, there are other, various other shortcomings also, even the selection of the Lokpal to a very large extent would be controlled by the political class under the official act which finally came. But even though that act came almost two years ago, it was passed about two years ago, till today we have not seen any Lokpal because even this present government, neither the previous government nor the present government are interested at all in having any kind of Lokpal. And therefore they have successfully stymied even the appointment of this Lokpal. <coughs> there was another case which we had taken to the court involving that engineer Satendra Dube, who was killed. All of you probably remember that. He was an engineer with the National Highway Authority who came across corruption by the National Highway Authority and who <coughs> wrote to the Prime Minister. And after that he was killed. So we filed a petition in the Supreme Court saying that his of course, his murder should be independently investigated, but we also said that there needs to be some independent authority created to take care of such complaints by whistleblowers, and that authority should have two kinds of powers. Firstly, the power to investigate the complaint of corruption made by that whistleblower, and secondly, the power to protect that whistleblower both from physical threats as well as from administrative harassment and administrative victimization, which often takes place by way of transfers, suspensions, etc., disciplinary proceedings against such officers who reveal corruption within their own departments. The Supreme Court in that case ordered that though there is no such, at that time there was no whistleblower law. Today there is a whistleblower law, but even that law has not been notified. And now there is an attempt being made by the government to dilute. That law again is a somewhat weak law, but the government wants to amend it before notifying it by weakening it further to say that if a whistleblower makes a complaint by providing any information 
to the Central Vigilance Commission, which cannot be obtained by a citizen under the Right to Information Act, then that whistleblower will be prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act. That's an absurd kind of amendment that the government is making. They are saying that the whistleblower authority, which is supposed to be the CVC, Central Vigilance Commission, cannot examine any complaint of corruption made by a whistleblower if that complaint involves giving of information which cannot normally be obtained by a citizen under the Right to Information Act and the CVC must ensure that the whistleblower is prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act. Anyway, so in that case, the Supreme Court did make an order that you, in that Satendra Dubey's case, they made an order saying that the government should bring in by way of administrative orders, create some authority which should have the right to entertain complaints from whistleblowers and protect these whistleblowers. So the government passed a notification notifying the Central Vigilance Commission to be that authority, having both these powers. Unfortunately, despite that notification, the experience over the last 10 years has been that the CVC has done virtually nothing. The CVC has done virtually nothing because unfortunately the CVC's appointments are controlled by the government. The CVC is appointed by a committee headed by the Prime Minister, Chief, uh, the uh, Home Minister and the Leader of Opposition. Now, Usually the leader of opposition also has the same interest in having weak and pliable people appointed to such anti-corruption institutions. Because the leader of opposition has been a minister in the past, has probably been prime minister in the past, hopes to become prime minister in the future again, and therefore he also wants that there should be a weak person in such an anti-corruption authority. And that is why when we formed this Jan Lokpal bill, we had said that in order to ensure the independence of the Lokpal, it's necessary that the Lokpal should have functional, financial, as well as independence by way of appointments, which meant that the Lokpal, functional independence means that you, government should not be able to control the actions of the Lokpal. Financial independence means that the government should not be able to choke off the supply of funds. For example, today, CVC has been theoretically made independent of the government, but the CVC's funding is completely controlled by the government. And with the result that the CVC has just been given very meager funds, as a result of which they do not have any investigating body of their own, through which they can investigate whistleblowers' complaints or through which they can supervise, effectively supervise the functioning of the CBI. And CVC's appointments are controlled by the government and therefore weak persons get appointed there. <coughs> and therefore, uh, that has not really worked out. The third institution which is very important for anti-corruption is the judiciary because ultimately the corruption cases have to be tried in the judiciary and it's the judiciary which has to give punishment. We all know that the judiciary, despite some of the very good orders that might come from time to time in public interest cases, some of the cases which you saw, which I have been involved in also, but if you see the overall situation of the judiciary, overall condition of the judiciary, the fact is that if you look at these corruption trials or any other trials for that matter, they go on for years and years, sometimes for decades. That trial against Sukhram, which started 30 years ago, the investigation, that corruption case against Sukhram, which started almost 30 years ago, that has still not been, trial was concluded, he was convicted, but now his appeal is pending in the High Court. So therefore, <coughs> judiciary is also largely dysfunctional. And again, no attempts have been made 
to bring about the kind of reforms that are required in the judiciary to ensure that the process of the judiciary is speeded up, that you have an adequate number of judges and courts, that you have competent judges by means of having a proper selection system for the judges and by way of ensuring that there is no corruption in the judiciary itself by having an independent judicial complaints authority. We don't have any authority or any uh, body at all which can hold judges to account, which can deal with uh, judges who are corrupt or who are misconducting themselves. So that brings me now to the role of the judiciary in dealing with corruption and the role that it has played so far. Uh, the judiciary, of course, primarily is a dispute resolving authority, that is, disputes between citizens or between the citizen and the state go to the judiciary and it is supposed to decide those. But more important than that, the judiciary has two other more important roles. One is that it is supposed to protect the fundamental rights of citizens which are guaranteed by the constitution. And secondly, it is supposed to ensure that the executive and the legislature act within the bounds of their authority and in fact do uh, that the executive does its duty when the situation calls upon for the exercise of that duty. So for example, in a corruption case, if a corruption complaint is made or any complaint is made to the police or to the CBI, it is the, not just the right, it is the duty of the police to investigate that case thoroughly, properly, quickly. If the uh, executive, that is the police, does not do its duty, then it is the right and the responsibility.